being perfectly rational. But it's a rational situation. Yeah, but love is not a rational situation. Love must be. It, it must be rational. Because this irrationality that we have does Look, not I was work. It destroys people. I quite agree with you. Hey, yo, hey, yo, hey, yo. Welcome to my channel. Hey, yo, hey, yo. Listen up. Listen up. All right, hey yo, hey yo, hey yo, welcome back Wi-Fi's and thank you for tuning in to the second part, the conclusion of the ongoing conversation between myself and poet and spoken word artist Elliot Axiom. Go ahead and do me a favor on your way in and like this video. You already know the drill. If you have not already, you can also subscribe to this channel. And click the bell for notifications. We're going to head back into a class that is already in session. Who are the male leaders today? And I don't want to just throw that on you, but I asked for a specific reason. So who are the black male leaders of today? I mean, I think if you are looking at it, it's who they always have been, which is our celebrities. I mean, even back then, we used to have our power bases in our community. So a lot of times the people like Reverend uh, Albert Klee. We are through with this white hypocrisy, with the efforts of white people to set up a situation that they can control. We are tired of sociologists and psychologists talking us to death. We are tired of police commissioners and police experts telling us that we're not getting our heads whipped. We are through. The black revolution is in progress and it's going on. You know, these these were religious leaders that got promoted out of their community to places of reverence and uh, influence. But they've always had the backing of the most financially affluent back pe black people back in that message. You know, we had... Um, help me. The comedian. Dick Gregory. Right. Thank you. We had Dick Gregory. Only a fool today would sit back and blame Hitler's army and not blame Hitler. That's why the whole world is looking at us very critical now. We had Bill Cosby. And there's a heavy-handed all-white treatment that just isn't fair, you see. You know, we had Muhammad Ali. In the history of my people with whites who are our real enemies, not the Viet Cong, not the Chinese, not the Japanese, our enemies, our oppressors, our opposers are white Americans. Nobody. I, I can see. I mm -hmm. We had Sam Cook. We had these black males that were willing to have one agenda, one message that was going forward. And I don't think that has changed because you look at Jay Z, Kanye West, you know. These are our entertainers, but I feel like the message has been compromised and it's been tainted with white supremacy. I agree totally. But we don't have our own infrastructure. We don't have a black power base for them to align themselves with because when we watch Colin Kaepernick take a knee, not I'm going with you. And everybody should have. Everybody should because have. Because if you want to make a comparison, I'm not comparing talents. But if you want to make a comparison to the gesture, you can look at Muhammad Ali refusing to go to the Vietnam War. Absolutely. He had people who backed him. Absolutely. Now, Colin Kaepernick had some people who backed him, but it wasn't in the same force. It wasn't the community because we don't have one anymore. And that was my that was the, the, the point that I wanted to touch on. I said those names of, those, of our great ancestors wow. who were killed, not who died for who were killed, assassinated. assassinated, trying to make things better for the people. Aside from perhaps the Reverend William Barber. As well, we need to not take this personal. It's not about us. It's about the heart of these cases where blackness, as for, a long, for, for years in, in American history, was identified with intimidation, and therefore the blackness itself is declining. Maybe you're Al Sharpton, maybe you're Jesse Jackson. Just talking about people who, who we may call that now. And to be honest with none of them are in the same 
seen in the same light as those leaders whom I mentioned. Yeah, I, they because they don't speak for a community. There is no community collective consciousness anymore. These are people that pander to to the white society. Let's let's be honest. I don't love all black people, really. You know, okay. you know. I know some deacons and um, and preachers and congressmen and and judges and teachers and lawyers. You know, black, but not like me. You know. Any one of our black male leaders that we have right now can be compromised. Like you said, fund them. Fund them and you'll quiet them. And, and that is why I said all that to say that we need black male leaders from within the community. You don't have to right. be a preacher. Right. don't have to be a celebrity. don't have to be a billionaire, millionaire, or even a thousandaire. I bought 40 acres of land to be able to teach the boys how to, you know, fend for themselves and, you know, uh, live off the land and grow their own food and things like that. What you need mm -hmm. is the backing of the community mm -hmm. because you have shown within the community yeah, that you perfect. are worthy to right. be a leader. And I'll take it one step further and say you don't even have to be the leader that black people want or that we would pick because you take a man like Malcolm X who was a felon mm -hmm. <laughs> who was in that same system of white supremacy mm -hmm. who capitalized at a certain point pimped and pushed in his own community mm -hmm. you know but still came to leadership in its defense through being the leader that we needed at the time because we have everything they didn't have resources we have media to be able to organize and align ourselves around so now my question to you is why don't we you know we are able we are at that egyptian place where we can be at the top of civilization we're putting three trillion dollars into the economy we, we spend more than we make. So we're the only group of people that's willing to fund this economy to our destruction, detriment, and ruin. To, to put our children in generational chains and behind in the generational wealth matrix all for the sake of pushing this system forward. So why don't we use everything that we're already using to promote another community to now come back in and enrich our own? We have Big Wall Street, Greenwood, down North Carolina with Rosewood. Rosewood. Wilmington, North Carolina, the only successful coup in America where the white township killed, destroyed, and drove out the black city council and the black people there, and then took over the city. So we have. And the society around has attacked it. Mm -hmm. Can we and should we be doing it again? Yes. Yes. Are we in pockets? But, but we could be doing it on a large scale. On a much larger scale. Yeah. Why we are not? I'm going to look in the camera and say this. I don't have the answer. I do. <laughs> well, I don't have an answer, but I can hypothesize. Mm -hmm. And I will I will say this. We have something now on our side that we never had before, which is the evidence. You know, it that cannot be suppressed. Like the only reason why we see cops being convicted for what they did is because it's undeniable. It is because you get to watch this man kneel on another man's neck for nine minutes to all of his protests, to all of the protests of people around them, it can't be denied anymore. And I think that puts us in a unique place as black people now to say, we're not going to take it. No, we ain't going to take it. And I think that if I'm hypothesizing, we are in a patriarchy, and I think this is the place where we can begin to delve into that divide between black men and black women because we're pointing fingers at each other, feeling like we are being oppressive to each other. But I see it as we are in a white male patriarchy. 
everybody is under the thumb of the white male patriarchy. Everybody. Because you see, the reason that people think it's important to be white is they think it's important not to be black. They think it's important to be white because white means you are civilized and being black means you're not civilized. Now, to what extent we use the hand of white supremacy against each other is, is to what you know extent we will destroy our own community. But I honestly, honestly feel that if our men don't come back from the precipice of being corrupted, because we're talking about a morality now. We've already seen the deconstruction of the black church as a power center. We're watching black men on a large scale be about commercialism. We're not building families. We're not building communities. We're not building homes. We're just getting the money. And we're going to be in front of our community showing off that we got money, but not actually coming back to any power base. And when you say we... You're talking about black male celebrities right now. I'm talking about this This divide is from the top to the bottom. Like I said, when we saw black men out in front of their community saying, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. What's going on? What's happening? Say it loud! They were members of the community and they were using their platform to to mirror, convey, communicate what was going on in their communities. So if our black male celebrities are currently displaying, because like I said, we never switched at any point as people behind which people we follow. We saw an uptick in gang violence because of gangster rap. We saw up, upticks in, you know, drugs in our community because of the, you know, the, the drug uh, culture in our music. So we've never deviated from following these same people. I teach my kids off that there is only one quality you need, one thing you need to be a leader. And so when we look at leaders, we just mentioned, you know, some of our great ancestors. I mean, you just mentioned a lot of black male celebrities. There is a difference there. And I think that's what the lack is. The difference is the intention. Mm -hmm. What intention does a celebrity, regardless of black male or, or not, what is their intention? Mm -hmm. Make money, be famous, entertain. There is nothing in there that says or teaches them how to be a good leader. Mm -hmm. But we put all of our backing behind them because they are the only leader. If this is the only game in town. There's another way I would, I would put it. I would, I would suggest that it's, since his game is running, he hasn't got to know you because his game is running. No, you're part of the game he's running. He hasn't got to know you. I would think that one of the reasons that, that uh, the Americans are in such trouble now is because the game is running. If it's the only grocery store, you gotta, and you, you got to buy your bread somewhere, right? Right. So, so when you talk about these leaders that will need to be transformative, we need really those leaders who were transformative mm -hmm. and look for something that's comparable here or become that comparable. Mm -hmm. And so I you know, issue that to my brothers. We have to become those leaders. And they can just take all of them they want to. We're always going to have someone to fulfill that position because that's the type of organization the, the Black Panther Party is. We don't produce buffoons, we produce leaders. But everybody in the Black Panther Party on any type of cadre, he's becoming a leader. We have to be comparable to the leaders whom others wanted to follow. Now, let's also, you know, not romanticize and glorify history. Not everybody was really down with Malcolm X or Martin Luther King. Oh, absolutely not. You know, so when we also talk about why don't we have these leaders, we have to look at the fact that there are some good leaders who are out there. Absolutely. We may not even know who their names are because they haven't reached that platform. They haven't been allowed in by the gatekeepers or they've been purposefully kept down. 
This is true, but it goes back to the economics. It goes back to the education. There are no institutions through which to funnel these people. There is no way to build a platform for them to use their messages for good on a you know, on a larger scale, because like I said, we've moved away from all of our institutions. We moved away from black church. We moved away from black marriage. And this is what's happening also today. It looks like a black man can't make it with a black woman. If somebody looks at the two of us, man, we're the weirdest looking people on earth because you went your way and I went my way, which uh, is saying the same thing. And that's sort of a shame to say Nikki, that a, I can't Nikki, have a black man standing Nikki, with me and you can't have a black woman because we wouldn't be who we are if we had. But and Nikki, that's a fact. But Nikki. We moved away from black entrepreneurship. You know, I, I saw this message where they were saying that, you know, um, we need to start building up black businesses. Mm. Well, we have. We have. We built up BET and they sold it. <laughs> you know, we put all these money in the Jordans, but all that money funnels in the white hands. You know, we built up Carol's Daughter and they sold it because it's capitalism. We were never in this to build generational wealth that we could pass down to our children. We were in this to make money and get out. Here's my question. Here's my take on it because when we speak to what needs to happen, on the flip side of that, though, you have women like Kataji Brown Jackson. We have these women like Stacey Abrams. You know, we have Alma Adams. We have all of these women who are doing what they can to move this needle forward for the community. And it seems to me that it's driving a deeper wedge between black men and black women. I have seen how the community, and even today in 1971, even today there are divisions based on those same yes, kind of do. problems. That's right. So that the black men say, in order for me to be a man, you walk 10 paces behind me. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, it means nothing. I can walk 10 paces behind the dog. It means nothing to me. But if that's what he needs, I'll never get far enough behind him for him to be a man. You know what I mean? Look, I'll never walk that slowly. Look, Nikki. And I don't understand how things that move the community forward or should, because we're talking about women that are actually giving back to the community. You you have these black women now who are out trying to lead the community, you know, and I'm ambivalent about it because I feel like it's deeper in the white places, but I also don't believe they have what they need to build institutions and build infrastructure if our black men are going to be divergent from that vision, that goal. Nicole Booker. And um, this is some nominal sense of doing phenomenal things. The wedge is being driven in the black community is a macrocosm of the microcosm of, as you say, the deconstruction of the black family. The people enough, you'll see that that same syndrome, you know, the little guys that mm -hmm. are standing around crossing mm -hmm. their arms mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. they're not lovable. They're not giving any love. They could give a damn about me. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's unfortunate because I need love. Yes, but sweetheart. Mm -hmm. It's on a level that's, that's a lot more complicated and a lot deeper. Do the, you think it's changed from the original conversation that they were having in 1971? Because even then, you had women that were saying to black men, just come home. We don't care if you have jobs or not. We don't care if you're moving the community needle forward, you know. But there was a lot of abandonment that happened in in that time as a re, as a result of joblessness. You know these same economic factors that could we could find ourselves coming right back around to again. So what has changed? Well, we touched on earlier the fact that you know when were black men in positions of leadership as far as in the community as well as in the home? Mm -hmm. We looked at slavery. Mm -hmm. No. Um, and from that, honestly, is where I believe a lot, I believe is the root cause of the division between black men and black women. After slavery, you had radical reconstruction, which was a time when we had a lot of black male leadership mm -hmm. until that backroom meeting where they made Hayes president in exchange for taking all the federal troops out of the South, which mm -hmm. is where you then had segregation. Yeah. And and there, no, there, there wasn't much black leadership as far as right after segregation was installed. Again, you had black men being ripped from the family. 
peonage. If you didn't have a job, you went to prison. Yeah. That moved into the 60s. Segregation so civil rights. Here you had Panthers. And you had your Stokely Carmichael. We have to understand that we're talking about our survival and nothing else. Whether or not this beautiful race of people is going to survive on the earth. That's what we're talking about. Nothing else. Nothing else. Right. Um, you had your body seal. You had your, I mean, you know, P. Newton. Yeah, we, we, we went through uh, Fred Hampton. You had your black leadership, strong black leadership. Mm -hmm. You had them were attacked on all sides. Yeah, they were infiltrated from the inside out. Mm -hmm. And then you have mass incarceration. And now you have today. Oh, excuse me. We, we, we skipped over the welfare part. Man, it was more profitable. Um, and, and, and Baldwin says, you know, he didn't realize about his father. It goes because the pressures under which you live are inhuman. My father finally went mad. And I understood when I became a man how that could happen. It wasn't that he didn't love us, he loved us. It wasn't that he didn't love his wife, his, our mother. He loved her, but he couldn't take it. Day after day, and hour after hour, being treated like a nigger. We make $27.50 a week, taking care of a wife and nine kids. Yeah. And I posit, well, if that black man would have left the home and then welfare would have given $30, yeah. and then another mouth was gone, would that have been better for the family? Yeah, it benefits the family, but... but at the end of the day, if you have men that have jobs that can provide for families, then then you don't need welfare to come in and take them out of the home. It's not like these men, these women traded out. Or I don't believe that all of these situations were a matter of women trading out their whole entire man to be provided for by the system, unless there had already been a lack of provision there. That's that's the only way any of that is even attractive. Just like. We're seeing right now, there's a lot of that same Bill O'Neill traitorism going on with us because at the end of the day, it's more lucrative. It's more uh, profitable to to gain the world and sell your soul, you know, to, to gain notoriety and sell out your own culture and your own people. And I think that's why it's been so difficult to get everybody to come back and focus on this as a community level. I can only speak as a black woman and I expect you to speak as a black man, but I can only speak as a black woman and say all of the stuff about, you know, y'all are overweight. Y'all have bad attitudes. Black women have, you know, um, black women won't submit. All of these things to me are the new welfare took the man out of the home, if you will, because at the end of the day, I should not have to look a certain way in order for you to want to build your community. I shouldn't have to look a certain way for you to see my son and want to help him. You know, even if I'm a single mom that had a baby by a Pookie or a Ray Ray, the only reason why that would even be, even matter, is if you want to be with me in some intimate, interpersonal relationship. But if there is nothing for us to be building together, then what's the point? You know, we and and one thing I said I wouldn't do in this conversation is is converge on how we're different. You're an unmarried black man that has no children. Sure. We will have these conversations as black women that says, well, we won't marry you all because it has nothing to do with building our community. You know, I might be the woman for you. I might not. But we should be able to sit here and have these discussions about how we can buy multifamily properties, how we can do homeschooling, how we can, without any of that being what we're showing to the rest of the world. I really feel like black people have showed the whole entire rest of the world their ass, whether it was drugs in our community, whether it was division over, you know, um, welfare or whatever it is. But we never can sit down and put those things aside. Slavery, the war on drugs, mass incarceration, 13th Amendment. We have to start somewhere with what we have. And I think at some point, if we're going to build trust, 
we got to all put our weapons down. No, we have to put all the weapons down. We also have to acknowledge the weapons that have been used against us from the outside. We have to acknowledge who gave those weapons. I'm single, unmarried, with no kids. But if I had children, whether I was married to the mother or not, I'd be there. And right. one of the reasons I don't have children is because yes. I wanted to get married right. before I had children. But see, that's the narrative because I think the narrative is being spun. Because I'm going to tell you, that's how I see it. Being spun that black men don't want to be married. And I'm not going to say they do it at all because I ain't one. But I think from a standpoint like yours, for the black men who are being reproductively responsible, see, that's a different narrative. Just like for the women who, if you're 30 or 40 as a woman and you don't have children, it's like, well, what's wrong with you? You're a spinster. Instead of you're reproductively responsible. I'm not married. I didn't want to have children that I would not be there for in the household. You know, economically, I wasn't in a place, whatever your decisions were. But when we look at the marriage rate, being lower than the being lower than the divorce rate. You know, we have to begin now to change these narratives. Well, now it's like you want to trade that at a premium. Do you get my point? But you are different than a lot of men that I meet that have that as their credo, as their badge, because you're in the lives of children. You're in the lives of women. But a lot of men use that comment to say, for that reason, you peons get away from me, you know, and I think that's the place where the narratives are being turned around that kind of no matter how we're coming at each other to relate as black men and black women, we're coming with some sort of negative connotation on everything that we bring. And that's by design. Right. The media society, all that what the representation looks like, you are hard pressed to find a commercial or a TV show that exemplifies or shows black love, okay? Mm -hmm. Black man, black woman. The divisions that are there are there from both sides. Black men have done it, black women have done it. The, the, the hype up from, from, from your friends, male or female, about not being with this person for this reason, or you can be with that person for this reason, or girl, you can do better than her, him, and, and, and man, you can do better than her. All of that is within the whole system, but we're talking about the black system. In order for this to happen, in order for this to happen, we have to say and be intentional and agree mm -hmm. that we're going to do it. Right. But that's the thing that I'm hearing, because it's like I said, what goes on on media is one thing. Unfortunately, though, it's going to always have an effect on how we relate to each other. But behind the scenes, that's all that I hear black men say. Listen, we want to be with black women. We want to have black marriages and black children and black families. But we need y'all to submit to us. But look at it on a on a macro chasm which is submit to us for what because it goes back again to building those communities and you're right we had a lot of black men in in position and when you talked about the um, reconstruction i think we're in that time again right now like we finally have black men who are in economic position to make changes to to be a part of families and communities and be a part of these discussions, you know, but that's what it keeps coming down to is we need y'all to submit. We don't want y'all if y'all have children. We don't what we don't, we don't, we don't. And what I liken it to when I look at it as a woman from the outside is like when Black Lives Matter came in and we was like, yes, Finally, this is our thing. Like we caught them, we caught them on camera. We got a group of people. We're organized. We're in the street. White people with us. We marching. You know, we got some white folks with white privilege out here with shields on. It's gonna be perfect. And then this is what they said to us. They said, "What do you want? What do you want? Like, how do we make this stop? What do you want?" And you know what we said? Uh, uh. The uh, defense of the police. Yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> Reparations. Um, we had no idea. And I feel like that's the place where we as black women with our men are. We're getting all these conflicting messages. We want you to go 50-50 with us, but we want you to not have an education. But we want you to, you know, come to the table and know your role and know how to cook. But you don't have any men in your household. So we just want you to guess, but we want you to know. And it's becoming... For me, the reason why this why I find it problematic and I find it an issue is because we're not having the how do we build our community discussion. I have no problem submitting to the vision that a man has. But if I ask you what you want and what you want is conflicting to the best interest of the community, how can we get behind that and follow that? When they follow Huey P. Newton, when they follow the Black Panther Party, when they follow Malcolm X, when they follow Martin Luther King into that burning house, <laughs> there was a vision, though. Right. You said that you had no problem submitting to a Black man as long as he had the vision that you thought he should have. That's what I just heard. I see where you got that. And I see what you're doing. I'm not arguing. I'm, I'm about the community. So, and I know that you are as well. Yes. But, I, but regardless of those two facts, <laughs> when you said that you were, are able to submit to a black man who mm -hmm. has a vision that you have for you. Okay? Mm -hmm. So we took away the, the good part of it, the good connotation. And then we, we, we took that same attitude, attitude being the operative word, but maybe the wrong one. Anyway, we took that same outlook and we just placed it on a whole bunch of different people, a whole bunch we of did. different relationships. We did. And then what do we then have? You, you then have a group of people who are saying, I will follow you if you will lead me where I want to go anyway. Our big problem is we worry too much about the domination and the submission. I agree. We worry too much about the leaders and the followers. I agree. The Black Panther Party, majority women. You had great male, black male leaders. You had great black female leaders. Mm -hmm. For me, that's one of the, the paramount examples. Then you, 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 you have to take what we have right here, right now. Right. And you have to say, I forgive you. I trust you. I believe in you. I forgive you. And then, from that point, you have to move forward. Thank you so much for sticking around until the very end of this episode. And thank you for joining me and Elliot on this journey that we decided to take with each other. It brought up a lot of emotions and we were very vulnerable and open with each other. And I hope that more black men and black women will begin to sit down and have these discussions with each other because this is really what we need in order to rebuild our community we need reciprocity and resolution and to listen and to answer. We need accountability and for each of us to take responsibility, not just for ourselves and our own actions, but for each other to understand that we're interdependent and inner related, that one of us cannot be greater or more successful than the other without the other. I'm hoping that this discussion will begin to spur other discussions across the genders, across the aisles. But if you liked this episode, you might want to check out part one of this discussion. And if you haven't already, go ahead and click that link to subscribe to my channel. Until the next time, be unplugged, unbothered, and unleashed. You're not niggas.